Hello and welcome to the latest in my Tracks Through Time video series. One of the commonly held misconceptions about transport history is that the railways arrived and people think that everything that was moving went over to them. Not exactly the case. Into the 1840s and 1850s, the railway's dominance on inland transport was not assured in many, many sectors of the economy. Indeed, we find if we look at particular commodities and their movement, that the transition to rail was determined not by the mere existence of a railway line, but by a whole host of social, economic, business, and even biological factors. That is the case with what we'll be looking at today, which is the transition of milk to rail transport in the 19th century. And that happens really significantly in the 1860s, so long after the railways had actually arrived. The product is perishable. If we leave milk for a long time, it goes sour. And that is a key consideration in why and when and how milk moves to rail. So we'll be looking at this particularly with regard to the London trade. Up to the 1860s, because of the perishability of milk, it was predominantly produced in the back streets of London in urban dairies or bought in from suburban farms in places such as Hendon or Norwood, and then the milk was sold locally. As London expanded, demand for milk did too, and some limited amounts of milk was brought into the capital by rail, as urban supplies could not be demand. In 1845, milk was brought in from places less than 25 miles away from the capital. They all had convenient rail links, for example Romford, and the Eastern Counties Railway was actually a big carrier of milk. Indeed, in 1846, the Staffordshire Advertiser speculated that milk via rail could be a remedy for the capital supply problems. But railway milk, as a proportion of all that consumed in the capital, remained small. And indeed, there was suspicion about it. It came from far, so it could sour and go off, it might become contaminated, and it might be bulked out with water. Indeed, people still very much preferred milk warm from the cow because they knew the source and they could trust the source. Moreover, the railway companies didn't seem to want to encourage the milk by rail trade. It was a bulky good, it was difficult to handle and it didn't make them a huge amount of profit. In fact, the railway companies only were carrying 28% of London's milk supply by 1861. All this changes in the 1860s though. In the 1850s, suburban and urban dairies come under significant pressure. They had already been feeling the impact of urban spread as grazing lands became unavailable, forcing up rents and pushing them outwards. Rising rents also meant that cow sheds became smaller, whilst there was more importing of foodstuffs for cattle as grazing lands in and around the city shrank. It was, however, the outbreak of cattle plague in 1865-66 that really hurt the urban and suburban dairies. With cows packed into cramped conditions, the plague spread like wildfire. Before it, London had 24,000 cows. After it, the number was halved. To meet urban demand, country producers stepped up to the plate. For instance, the London North Western Railway carried 86,000 gallons of milk into London in 1864. But the figure in 1866 was 1 1.21 million gallons. The graph on the screen shows that when the plague hit, the amount of milk being moved into London by five major railway companies grew significantly. It rose from 128,000 gallons in January 1865 to 607,000 gallons in May 1866. But this change also affected the nature of milk producers' activity. The Hampshire Advertiser stated in November 1865 that because of increased London demand, Hampshire dairymen had to abandon cheese and butter production to send their milk off to town. The other thing to note about the graph is that once the crisis had passed, the amount of milk coming into the capital by rail did not return to pre-plague levels. The amount of milk brought into the capital by rail grew considerably from this point onwards. In 1865, the figure was 3.4 million gallons. By 1913, it was 88.1 million gallons and showing the decline of urban and suburban dairies, in 1910 only 2% of milk 
drunk in the capital came from these sources. Yet showing how changes in production are complex and cannot be attributed to one factor, the railway alone did not lead to the decline of suburban and urban dairies. These were already businesses under pressure, and after the plague they had stricter hygiene conditions, which became a financial burden. Moreover, the previously profitable slaughter of dairy cows when their production fell and their replacement with another cow became less lucrative as cheaper meats were imported from outside of Britain. But this idea that the railways were not the sole factor in changing a business's production capacity, output, distribution, etc. is also seen when we look at country producers. They too were beset by a range of issues affecting their profitability and the agricultural depression of the late 19th century compelled many to turn to the relatively secure liquid milk trade. Although those dairies that did turn their business towards supplying liquid milk to distant markets were usually along railway lines and this led to a specialisation of milk producers along them. Other factors from beyond the railway also led to a growth in the railway milk trade. Firstly, London grew, so demand was higher, but individually people started consuming more milk. On top of that, the problem of distance and milk souring in transit was overcome. Firstly, chemical preservatives came in, but cooling technology from the 1870s particularly allowed the railway milk trade to flourish. As the railway milk trade evolved over the late 19th century, some companies became dominant. The Great Western Railway became the largest supplier of milk to the capital, and in 1899 it brought in 23.5 million gallons, just over half of London's total supply. Here again, though, we see the perishability of milk being a factor in the nature of its movement. The high speeds of the express were to keep the milk in good condition, and also in cooler months, milk would be sent from further to London, for example, from Cornwall. But the railways are just one significant element in a supply chain that facilitates the movement of the milk from producer to consumer. And without other actors, it's arguable those journeys would never have taken place. This is clear in a report from 1903 on Finsbury's milk supply. Whereas in 1865, most of Finsbury's milk came from within 25 miles, by 1903, the figure was only 0.7%. 95% of it came from Derbyshire, Staffordshire, Leicestershire, Warwickshire and Wiltshire and it spent on average 10 to 12 hours on trains. This is a good example of how the distance between producer and consumer lengthened and as with the rest of the milk supply business, new intermediaries came onto the scene and emerged to facilitate the supply. The most important of these were the wholesalers or contractors who became the most important individuals in the supply chain. From here on I will use the name contractors as that is what was used in the Finsbury report. The Finsbury report stated that one local contractor had a list of farms that were four miles from the railway line from which he would get his milk. Based in London he would not actually deal with the farms directly and use agents to arrange the supply. However it was the contractor who was ultimately in control who had to match supply against demand. So how did this actually work? How did milk move from one place to the other? Well, the cows were milked at about four to six in the evening. The milk was dispatched quickly and arrived at Euston or St Pancras at three or four in the morning. The contractor and his vans would meet the trains. They would collect about a thousand to one and a half thousand gallons of milk. And by 6 a.m. this was at the shops or alternatively with wholesalers who would sell it on. As shown in this diagram, one contractor in Finsbury ultimately supplied 32 shops. Moreover, unlike the days of the dominance of the suburban and urban dairies, when your consumer would know the producer of the milk probably, and perhaps even which cow it came from, the lengthening of the supply chain in the late 19th century meant that your consumer had no idea from what source the milk came from, and it just turned up. Fundamentally, the contractor was therefore key to making the whole supply chain work. And large intermediary firms emerged between producer and consumer. One of the most famous was the Express County Milk Supply Company that later became simply Express Dairies. They used express trains to get their milk to London. 
Founded by George Barnum in 1864, he negotiated special rates with the Great Northern and Midland Railways to supply very large volumes of milk from Derbyshire to London terminals. Then it went on to the company's central depot in London and then on to shops. It is also worth noting that express dairies introduced from America the galvanised metal milk churn to improve delivery and the sanitation of the process. Ultimately, what the story of the development of railway milk demonstrates is that the mere existence of a railway line did not necessarily mean producers automatically started sending their goods by them. Indeed, the milk trade demonstrates how a whole host of factors, whether they're social, economic, business or biological, can influence the pattern of development of different traffics and different supply chains. So next time someone says to you that the railways arrived and there was a big bang and everything started going by railways, just point out that there's a bit more nuance to be explored. So I hope you've enjoyed the video and uh, see you next time.